Jamie Herschler. Dr. Herschler obtained his medical degree at the Medical College of Ohio at Toledo in 1993. He went on to do his medical internship, psychiatry residency, and addiction fellowship, all at the University of Maryland. He, after that, worked at the University of Maryland in a number of their hospitals um, as a consultation liaison in addiction psychiatry. Um, he also worked through the VA system in the Maryland health care system um, for a number of years. He was an attending psychiatrist, a medical director of the methadone ma maintenance program, um, among other jobs, and also an inpatient psychiatry service for some time. Um, and then he moved to Cumberland, Maryland, where he was also a staff psychiatrist for inpatient psychiatry. Um, Allegheny County Health was a staff psychiatrist there as well. And then in 2017, Dr. Herschler moved to our department at West Virginia University Department of Behavioral Medicine and Psychiatry. And he also runs the Addiction Psychiatry Fellowship here. So we're lucky to have him. And today he'll be speaking on identity and health. We enact our sense of self. So thank you, Dr. Herschler. Thank you, Melanie, for that kind introduction. So I'm going to talk about identity and health. And this image that you see of the ring with that uh, jewel on the inside kind of gives you a sense of how identity is internal. And uh, it actually impacts a lot of our health, and, and not just health and illness, but flourishing also. And so I want to talk in the beginning here about how I got interested in identity and health and uh, tell you a little a personal story. So uh, when I was in college, I was a chemistry major and uh, the, probably the toughest class in chemistry in college was organic chemistry. And the professor who taught that course was the chairman of the department. And he was so deep into his work. He would, we used chalkboards back then and he would uh, write with one hand and erase with the other and have these uh, kind of rapid paced lectures that he gave. And at the end of the lecture, he would immediately light up a cigarette after he was done. And so my friend Tony and I, who studied together, got this idea that we would try tobacco, you know, to see why this uh, chemistry professor was so, uh, you know, invested in smoking. And so I started smoking in college and uh, I played baseball on the, the college baseball team and smoked playing baseball and I smoked in medical school. Uh, you know, even I, I learned all the ill effects of tobacco on, on people's health and still smoked. I would be on the front steps of the medical school smoking, and I dated a girl who also smoked in medical school. And then finally, when I was in my addiction psychiatry fellowship, I had a psychotherapy supervisor who was interested in helping me stop smoking. And he said, you know, you need to make a shift between thinking of yourself as a smoker and thinking of yourself as a non-smoker. And so it's actually a shift in identity that happens that allows a person to make that change in, in their behavior. And so that's what really got me thinking about this. And that stuck with me. And I eventually did quit smoking and haven't done that in many years. And, and uh, so it, it really stuck with me, this concept of making a shift in identity. And so I'm going to talk about identity in physical health and mental health and addictions and also in flourishing. And so you'll, I'm interested in positive psychiatry. So you'll see how it impacts all aspects of functioning really. So I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. So this map is a map of the Washington DC area. And these numbers that you're looking at are the life expectancies for people born in these different areas. And so if you look at inner city DC, the life expectancy is very different from, say, uh, Shady Grove over there, where the life expectancy in the Northwest is 84 years. And so there's a difference in something happening, you know, the social determinants of health that determine how long people live. And so there's actually a social gradient uh, and something that uh, impacts people's uh, health that's, uh, you can see it just in the, the zip code that people live in. And so what that boils down to is the resources that people have. And so we tend to think of the external resources that are impacting the social uh, determinants of health. And so you have money and economic stability and the time that people have and the food and food security and the people in their lives and solidarity and social integration. 
and their level of education and the health care that's available and the quality of the health care. And then just the neighborhood and the environment that they're in and having a secure sense of home. But there's also internal resources. And so those internal resources are like identity, energy, and inner strengths. And so we're going to take a look at the internal resource identity and see how that's impacting health. So of course, ideally, we want to optimize our human resources. Now, these are rhesus monkeys. And actually, rhesus monkeys also have a social gradient affecting their health. And so more mature and larger monkeys that are higher up on the social gradient have better health than the ones that are lower on the social gradient. And we're going to talk about that later in, the, in this uh, discussion. Now, do you guys know who these two people are? Anybody know who these guys are? Chi Chen Chong. Correct, Chi Chen Chong. So these guys are famous actors who uh, portrayed what it's like to be a pothead back in the 1970s. And so pothead is kind of an identity and there's a visual identity associated with that identity back in the 1970s. And so you can see what these guys look like and how that, that identity is shaped who they are. And how about these guys? Who are these people? Billionaires. Yeah, so these are the richest people in the United States. And sadly, they're all men and they're all Caucasian. But uh, th these are the richest people. And so they have an identity. And I'm going to talk about a couple of these guys' identities you know, that they've discussed in lectures that they've given and, and, and in interviews. And, uh, and so they have a different visual identity as well as who they are within themselves. And you can see that just looking at them, that their visual identity is certainly different from the, the potheads from the 1970s that we saw in Chi and Chong. So what are the learning objectives? We're gonna define identity. We're gonna describe the theory and elements of identity. We're gonna explain the process of identity enactment. We're gonna illustrate identity's role in health and illness. We're gonna illustrate identity's role in failure, success and flourishing. We're gonna describe identity enactments tied to substance use disorders. And we're gonna illustrate the radical shift in identity that promotes recovery. We're going to go over some theoretical case examples, which are addiction focused, since that's kind of my specialty. And then we're going to go over some discussion points and then talk about some future directions. All right, so what is identity? Well, identity is the combination of characteristics that make someone who they are. And there's a historical continuity and a, same, a sameness of self. So this is present over a period of time in a person's life. You can kind of follow this kind of identity that, they, that is part of them. And it includes the self with both physical and mental boundaries. And it's where the self is located. And so it's self-definition. And you can think of it as the likes and dislikes of somebody and their talents and limitations. And in psychoanalysis, they talk about having a consolidated sense of identity as important in well-being. And so what is a consolidated sense of identity? That means that you're comfortable with your likes and dislikes and have a sense of strength about you, but also know your limitations. And when that's not present, people don't tend to do as well. So what about the theory and the elements of identity? So what we have learned is that we enact our identity. We enact who we are. And so our identity is actually a causality. It's, it's going to determine who we become. And so think of an athlete, for example. A person who thinks of themselves as an athlete is expected to perform physically in certain standards. You know, that because they're an athlete, you just expect them to behave in certain ways because they have that identity. And so it applies to many other things besides an athlete. That's probably a good way to get kind of an image of how if someone views themselves as an athlete, they're going to have certain behaviors and, and ways of being that are related to that. Now, also, social structures impinge on the self. And so you, there's a social effect on your identity that shapes self-concept. And some people, their, their self-concept is entirely related to their career. So they may think of a, their occupation as their identity. 
but the, it, there's so much more to identity than that. And so our identity is shaped by our shaped by our likes and dislikes. So who are your favorite artists or brands or other likes and dislikes that you have? And it's also shaped by the roles that you play in society and your role choice in the ecosystems in which you uh, are living. And then as I was talking about, we have a visual identity. So uh, the fashion industry is very interested in visual identity. And actually a lot of progress that's been made in what and how identities are enacted and, and what happens with identity can be learned from the fashion industry because they've, they've made a lot of progress in how to improve people's identities that way. So what about cultural identity? So we acculturate to the culture we become part of. And so a group has its essence or its identity, and that takes a lot of time. There's duration and consistency and continual validation that determines kind of the identity of a group. And then if you become part of that group, you acculturate into it, you take on the elements of that identity. And so if you think of the identity of Americans, you know, in the United States, the, the identity is the American dream. And so people who come from other countries come to the United States to live the American dream. And what they're talking about is uh, dreams of quality of life. So love, work, and health and place quality and, and, and dreams of improving their health confidence and their longevity. So uh, I, I think that's a really a beautiful identity of the United States that makes it very attractive to people around the world. So what about social roles and identity? Well, each role that a person has has certain expectations associated with it. And the goodness of fit of a role depends on the comfort of the role for the person and the meaning the role provides for them and also any other rewards of the role. And so you can work backward from a desired behavior. So going back to like athletes and exercise, fitness and a beautiful body, so you ask yourself, what sort of person has that expected behavior as part of their role? And so, uh, you know, if somebody wants to achieve certain things in life, you can imagine what kind of person would have that behavior as part of the role and let that drive, you know, kind of how you think of yourself. So the standards of behavior for each role create the leveraging power of identity. And so maybe ideally the social role that we want to have in order to flourish is a sense of importance. You know, when you get a sense of importance about you, that's associated, you know, what kind of, what kind of behavior is, is, is expected of somebody who has a sense of importance. And you can imagine that might mean an enactment of flourishing. So let's talk more about the enactment of identity. So what happens is that you bring behavior into agreement with the identity or role. And so the behavior matches the standards of the identity. So like a, if you think of our career role, so we all have different roles and in, in our work that we have, and there are certain standards of behavior associated with those roles. But all the roles that we serve, you know, parent or uh, a role in the community or uh, you know, a role among your friends. So, all those roles have kind of standards of, of behavior associated with them. And so there's, you can say that's the kind of thing that a person like me does. And so we get it, we kind of have a, a consistency uh, with our self-concept in all aspects of our lives. And Jason Selk, who's a sports psychologist, uh, he works with professional uh, baseball and football teams. He says that your self-image is like a thermostat. And so if you have a disempowering self-image, that's going to enact a different kind of behavior than if you have a powerful kind of self-image and you kind of turned up the heat on the thermostat, that's going to enact a different sort of behavior. I hope this is making sense to you guys. Is it making sense? All right. So is the health of an individual a good measure of how well his or her identity is doing? And so going, going back to the social gradient, you know, thinking of the DC area and those discrepancies between inner city DC and the suburbs, you know, it, you, you have social injustice kind of killing people on a grand scale at a short distance, meaning large disparities in health. And so how much is that social gradient impacting 
us via the identity enactments that people have. And it's interesting because the, the dis differences in health are found along the whole gradient. So not just the poor people with the least uh, economic means having bad health, but all the way along the gradient, there's variations in health. And it's interesting, it's not just socioeconomic factors. So actually people who work on enhancing their physical appearance also have better long-term health. And so caring for your beauty or your appearance is kind of part of a an overall health li a healthy lifestyle. And then we talked about the rhesus monkey. So actually there's research that shows that monkeys who are higher up on the social gradient respond to bacterial and viral infections better than animals that are lower on the social gradient. And so the, there's both internal and external resources to the social gradient. And so what I'm saying is maybe there's an identity gradient you know, but do, are there kind of variations in identity that are impacting our, our health, uh, levels of illness and flourishing in life? Now, Ellen Langer, who's a famous psychologist, uh, looked at age-related cues on health and longevity. And so what she found is that clothing is an age-related cue that affects our health. And so if somebody is dressing in kind of elderly sort of attire uh, that may trigger kind of an older persona and even impact their health. And it's interesting because men who bald prematurely tend to see an older self and then actually age faster than someone who doesn't have that. And you also see it in spousal age difference. So spouses who have dramatically different ages, the older spouse lives longer than spouses who have equivalent or close to equivalent age. And so being impacted by the younger spouse kind of affects your health and maybe through your identity. And so I wonder if looking at younger pictures of yourself when you get older, you know, if you, if you look at younger pictures of yourself thriving, does that cue health and flourishing? I don't know if you guys have read this book. It's a very interesting book. Uh, the author is Jeffrey Rediger. And uh, Jeffrey Rediger is a psychiatrist at McLean Hospital in Belmont, Massachusetts. It's uh, the best Harvard psychiatric hospital in their whole uh, network of hospitals. And he, he's done some interesting research. He got involved over the past couple of decades looking at people who have terminal illnesses and somehow they miraculously recovered from these illnesses where they were expected to die. And so this whole book is about these individuals that, you know, kind of a selection of individuals that he's met. And he's talked to people all over the world and reviewed their stories and looked at their imaging and the diagnostic information that was given to them. And so anyway, he has found some commonalities. He kind of did a descriptive study and found some commonalities of these spontaneous healers. And what he says is that probably the most important thing that he saw consistently was that there was a healing of identity in these people who had miraculous cures from terminal illnesses. And so it's not a double blind study, but that's what he was seeing in this descriptive study. And there's other things like activating the relaxation response and. Uh, having love in your life and healing trauma and seeking out someone who's kind of a master healer to work with and journeying on an immune uh, boosting pilgrimage and having positive beliefs and making radical dietary changes, often anti-inflammatory diet uh, kind of changes. And then refusing to be defined by their illness and healing their fear of death and then burning their boat. So what the, if, if you think of a military operation where they go to a a country by boat and land on the shore and go to attack the country. If you leave the boats intact, they can retreat. But if you burn the boats, they got to fight. And so uh, Rediger said these people really burned their boats. They, they just got in there and, and fought through this thing and, uh, and did these sort of activities that kind of helped them heal surprisingly. So it's, it's a pretty interesting book if you're interested in that sort of thing. So what about identity uh, in mental illness and addictions? 
So uh, you, you see this in all kinds of aspects of mental health and addictions. So a person might view the need to take medication as a like a contamination of their body, you know. And so some patients say, "Oh, I can't take a medicine. That's like a poison to me." And and so uh, there's other ways to look at it, as you'll see. And then someone with an addiction may say that they're dirty because they use a substance, but that affects their identity. You know, they're they're viewing their identity as a dirty person. And so I always talk to patients about let's talk about sober and not sober and use language that's empowering and not uh, disempower your identity by talking about being dirty. You know, I think that's kind of not promoting well-being. And then Tom Insull, who was the previous uh, director of NIMH, he was a director for over 10 years. Uh, he says that psychiatric disorders uh, manifest as changes in how we think, feel, and behave. And so what happens as a result of that is we tend to confuse illness and identity. And you actually hear this in the language that people use. So if somebody has heart disease, you say, I have heart disease. But someone in, in a, with a psychiatric disorder says, I'm bipolar or I'm schizophrenic. Or with an addiction, they say, I'm a pothead or a smoker or a cokehead or a drug addict or an alcoholic or a dope fiend. And so these illnesses become identities. And then they get a stunted sense of themselves because these identities have a negative connotation. And so we think of that related to stigma, which actually results in discrimination by the public, you know, because of their fears and, and just their ignorance about uh, these, these uh, illnesses. And so you can see how deeply identity formation can affect mental health and addictions. So how does identity get biologically embedded? And so, you know, thinking of these miraculous healings or people with illnesses that have negative connotations related to their identities. And it, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Bessel van der Kolk, who has written The Body Keeps the Score. It's a book about trauma. And what he, what he says is that the traumas and victories that people experience in their life get embodied. The body keeps the score for these experiences. And so, uh, you know, they kind of, the body kind of keeps a score of the negative legacy. And so I wonder if identities kind of have a, a body felt sense because of this same process, whatever makes that happen. And so you might also think, well, maybe identity gets related to, you know, the parasympathetic nervous system. And if somebody has a strong identity, they get more vagal tone. And if somebody has kind of a disempowered or a stunted identity, then they're going to have more cortisol and, and kind of more stress hormones and, and, a, and a, stress, a kind of fight or flight response because their identity isn't strong. And so can we improve identity to get better health? What about loneliness and identity? So when you think about uh, the the, the diseases and deaths of despair, loneliness, you know, is such a big issue for that. And uh, so social isolation is associated with depression, suicide, anxiety, insomnia, fear, and the perception of threats. And it's been linked to dementia, high blood pressure, heart disease, obesity, diabetes, uh, strokes, lower resistance to infections, autoimmune diseases, and domestic and, and automobile accidents. And so there's a lot of negative consequences associated with loneliness. And so people need to finesse the etiquette required to belong, you know, to measure up and fit in. And belonging is kind of a silent empowerment. And, and really it's an empowerment of identity. It's like a relational wealth, you know, that someone feels that they're in good company, that they belong to a positive, you know, kind of a, a positive, group. And yet, you know, it's interesting because you can reframe this and say, well, hey, you know, maybe it's empowering to stand solidly on your own. And so you can protect your identity by saying, you know, I, I, I have rugged independence, you know, I'm a, uh, I, I can stand solidly on my own. And so therefore, I'm empowered by solitude. And so that kind of takes away all the negative effects through identity that can happen to someone because they're lonely. What about identity and failure and flourishing? So I told you I was gonna talk about these billionaires. 
So Bill Gates' mother used to tell him he's a force. You know, ever since he was a kid, she'd say, you're a force. And then that became part of his identity. You know, what, how does a force get enacted by somebody? You know, what, what is the result of that kind of identity? And then Carl Icahn, who's a billionaire who buys and sells businesses and owns you know, all kinds of large businesses throughout the country, uh, his mother told him that he had a warrior gene. So this was, this was like in his DNA, this, this identity, this strong identity that he had. And then if you think about people who kind of are struggling you know, with a stunted identity, they may view themselves as a victim or lazy or psychologically damaged or contaminated or fragmented or inferior some way or a commoner or fundamentally defective or have a sense of a troubled self. And so you can see all these kind of identities playing a role in who these people become. And also socially, when people are discredited by the attitudes of other people socially, and there are attacks on identity, those, those kind of aspects of identity get enacted. So you have to protect yourself from the social impact on your identity. And I kind of learned this from hypnosis, you know, and hypnosis, you only accept what's acceptable that said, you know, a suggestion, if it's acceptable to the self, then you might do what they're suggesting. And it's the same way with attacks on identity. They're only interjected when they're acceptable to the self. And so you can stand guard at the door of your mind and think now, is this kind of thing this person is saying about who I am? You know, is this true of me or can, you know, maybe I shouldn't accept this and try to empower myself instead. So what about the radical shift in identity? So how do you get the right vibe shift? And so I was talking about thinking of yourself as a smoker versus thinking of yourself as a non-smoker. That's a real easy way to see it. But it's basically going from a stunted, it's going from a stunted sense of self to a strong and distinctive sense of self. And Temple Grandin, who's a well-spoken person who's written about autism, and she's, she's actually made some inventions related to the work that she does, and just a beautiful person. She says, I'm different, not less. So I have autism, I'm different, not less. And so that's just a beautiful way to think about how you can empower yourself, even though you've been labeled with some condition. So how do we advance identity? You know, if, if having an empowered identity or a stronger identity is going to get enacted in a positive way and have a good outcome for people, how can we advance identity? And so there's three ways to do it. One way is to mitigate problems with the identity. And so you recognize that the identity is stunted in some way and do things to correct that stunting aspect. And you can also assemble parts that are that are positive. And uh, lastly, you can have growth of your identity. And so I'm gonna talk about how that happens. So when you're mitigating problems with identity, you don't just wanna wait till that problem hits you over the head. You have to kind of be a problem seeker and look in your patients and in your personal life and anybody who you care about, you know, what aspects of this self has problems with the identity that could be remedied in some way and correct this stunting of identity. So that's one way to improve identity. And then you can assemble parts of the identity. So maybe you can develop a strong and distinctive look or a sound uh, or a scent, you know, a smell, an aroma, or a, a know-how or a skill. And so you assemble these parts and uh, it strengthens the identity. And then lastly, you can grow the identity. And the way you do that is kind of the same way that a tree grows in nature. So when, when a tree grows, it needs a healthy, an enriching environment. So you need sunlight and water and good nutrient soil. And so you can grow your identity by influencing your environment. And if you can, if you can have a more enriching environment, your identity is gonna to respond to this environment. And of course, if you have a negative environment, that's going to negatively impact your identity. So we have to think about what kind of parts do we want to assemble, what environment, 
And I, talk, we, I talked about leverage in a previous grand round. So we're really talking about the leverage of identity. You know, how do you leverage a, a stronger identity? And so it's not nature-inspired design. This is actually design-inspired nature. So it's a natural process that environment impacts the flourishing of or, or not flourishing of an organism. And so you can actually work to your environment to create a natural process that's going to empower your identity or a patient's identity. So what about correcting the narcissistic, narcissistic vulnerabilities that deplete identity? And so someone may still have emotional problems or layers of shame. Maybe they've been attacked, their identity has been attacked by their social environment. Maybe they feel there's something fundamentally wrong with themselves or, or there's something about their identity that depletes them or they feel disempowered. And so remember, these, these discrediting attitudes are only introjected when they're acceptable to the self. And so a person can stand guard at the door of their mind and, and notice when something is trying to impact their identity in a negative way and just refute it. Don't accept it. And so a strong and distinctive identity is associated with pride and good public standing, as well as good health. And so what I say is don't settle for a stunted identity for yourself, for a patient's self, for their family, for their community. And think about, does society honor you and credit you or are they discrediting? And so if you can target and claim a strong and distinctive identity and even have a bit of attitude about it, that's going to result in a better outcome. You know, what does it mean to think of yourself as a force or as a warrior? You know, have a DNA that's a warrior. And so you want to rebel against all of this kind of asinine BS that you hear in your life about yourself and dream of a better self. And so when you think of stunting, one, one place that we see stunting is in height, you know, physical height of, a, of an animal or a person. And so stunting of height occurs by a deficient diet. And so perhaps the stunting of identity is related to the nutrition that's supplied for our identity. And so you want to have nutrients that enhance your capability, your sense of capability, loveability, self-worth, value, and importance. And then maybe you can prevent stunting of identity. And part of the way to do that is through reframing. So like with trauma, people who have traumatic experiences, if they think, you know, if I could survive that, I could survive almost anything. And then when something new comes up, they think, you know, this, if something difficult comes up, they think, well, I've been through so much, this is not so bad by comparison. And they may even think that people who kind of have easy lives are sort of weaklings, you know, they've never been tested. And so that kind of empowers them. The trauma is never good, but it does, if you get through it, you, know, you can make your way through it, you're kind of a tougher person. And you, you can tolerate more distress than somebody maybe who hasn't been tested in that way. So you kind of go from a museum of scars to a, a symbol of a strong mindset and a positive mental approach. What about other reframes? So we're talking about being contaminated by a medicine. So actually a person could look at taking a medicine as it's a sacred medicine. This is something that's good for my well-being. It's sacred to me. And someone with a chronic illness, and they talk about uh, chronic illnesses being like a cucumber turning into a pickle. And so you can't turn a pickle back into a cucumber. And, and so it's kind of irreversible. So an example of this physically is, you know, say a woman with cancer gets a mastectomy. And so they may have plastic surgery, but they're never going to look like they did before they had the mastectomy. And so it's kind of like a cucumber becoming a pickle. And you see this with mental illness, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder. Uh, addictions are viewed this way. You know, once you change the biology of the brain, it, it doesn't really go back to the, the way it was before someone got caught up in substance use. And so your identity can grow the, into the healthiest and most confident and strong identity, you know, the strongest pickle possible. So maybe you've been changed, but you can still develop a strong identity, even though you're kind of like a pickled identity. And so elevating your identity is a silent empowerment. 
And so, you know, where, what are you going to construct? How are you going to enhance your life? And you don't want to get cemented in a negative self view. So, so many patients, you hear their stories and they're kind of stuck in this negative view of themselves. And we have to find ways, you know, those three ways to improve identity and help them kind of strengthen their identity so they enact kind of a healthier sense of self. And so one way to do that is to improve your visual identity in such an easy way. In the fashion industry, you see people looking at ways, you know, how can I enhance my appearance and, uh, and enact that? And so you want to negotiate an identity that satisfies contexts that are both risky to well-being as well as opportunities to flourish. And can identity impact your ruggedness and grit and mindset? You know, going back to that's the sort of thing that a person like me does. And so, you know, what are the thing, what are the kind of things that a person like me does? And how can I become the kind of person that does the things I want to do? And then also environment is important. So contact is essential to identity context. Uh, you don't want the noise of the environment to under, undermine your identity. And so you can, you can create an environment, you can travel to places where there are positive influence or meet people who are role models or muses that inspire you. And so we don't live in a vacuum of isolation. And ideally you wanna thrive under the scrutiny of the public gaze. So we, you, know, you see in kind of the media how negative the public gaze can be on people, especially in kind of, you know, that are celebrities. But uh, so you, you want to kind of thrive under that scrutiny. And so you, hopefully your social world affirms the strong and distinctive identity that the person that you're developing or that a patient is developing. And so in, in addictions, we develop that with a good recovery environment and social group reconstruction. And so social group reconstruction means getting all those phone numbers out of your phone that uh, are people who trigger substance use that are kind of pulling you down and associate with people who are a positive influence. What about role models and identity? So you can be like other ideal people until you can be better than them. So we never kind of think about, you know, maybe I can outdo this role model and you know, kind of go beyond what I see in them. And so when you study a role model, you want to understand why is their identity so strong? What is their motto, their likes and dislikes? their capabilities, their total beauty, and their good, you know, their definition of good taste. You know, what makes this person's identity so strong? And then one thing that's important to think about is that uh, you want to create unique value or unique know-how. And so uh, it may help to invest in a small number of value niches or build specific knowledge. And so when, you, when a person looks at their value map or even an organization looks at their value map, you wanna resist the temptation to simply catch up with a competition and rather find an opportunity to have unique value and know-how and get, gain the sense that you belong in the room being someone important because you kind of got niche areas of strength. And so it's so tough to kind of catch up with everybody else who's strong, but you can get your own little niches and develop strength that way. So how does the healing of identity work? Well, most importantly, it's being at ease with who you are. So comfortable in your social roles. And what we want to really nurture is a strong and distinctive identity for everyone. And what does that boil down to? What does a person like me do? So from the fashion industry, we've learned that uh, developing an identity involves rebellion and dreaming. And so what they say is if you don't have fantasy and identity, then identity will never change. And so every new identity is a form of rebellion and a sense of dream. And so you're not just a product of your diverse and rich history, but you kind of self-author your identity. And so some aspects of your old identity have to be set aside or abandoned. And so you don't want to merely fall into a socialized sense of self, but kind of self-author who you are. And so if you think about the fashion industry, people do all kinds of interesting things to self-author their identity and have a strong and distinctive identity uh, through, through visual appearance. But uh, there's so many other things that you can do to create niche strengths and, 
and enhance the identity. So we were, I was talking about how you can use your future identity to fashion your current self. So for example, say you're slacking with your fitness routine. So you might ask, what would me in six months from now do? So in six months from now, when I have a regular exercise routine, who is that person? And how can I kind of impersonate the future self doing the things that I want to do? And so you want to be a personal representation of how you want to live your life. All right, so some case examples. So these cases are not actual cases, they're kind of composites of, uh, you know, kind of my experience clinically. I've been practicing for about 28 years, so I've seen lots of cases. And these are just kind of some examples of what you will see with identity shifts. And these are substance use disorder patients, but please think of it in any aspects of mental health uh, or even in flourishing in life. So a 30 year old, first case, 30 year old male, with the history of opiate use disorder treated with Suboxone, 12 milligrams, three milligrams for five years. He started treatment feeling out of control with substance use and viewing his life situation as he has destroyed everything. He was using prescription opiate pills and heroin by snorting. He had been in several unstable relationships and he wasn't working. Money was tight. Fortunately, he had not gotten into legal trouble. He was intelligent, but viewed himself as a failure. After a year of treatment and a more stable life, he decided to go to nursing school to help others with addictions. When he finished school, he got his first job as a nurse. He viewed himself differently. He felt important, able to help others. He sponsored other people on Suboxone and NA. He developed a strong relationship with someone and saved money and bought a house with her. Overall, he's very happy with who he is now. So let's think about this shift in identity. Who was this guy? when he first got into treatment and who did he become? What do you guys think? No ideas. All right. So, well, so he he looked at himself as kind of destroying everything in his life. So he he uh, he saw himself as a failure. Uh, life was out of control. So, and then he shifted to feeling important. He was helping other people. You know, in recovery from mental illness, they talk about purpose, place, and people. And so, purpose can be so important in someone's identity and and well-being. And so he's giving back, you know, he's helping other people in NA, he's working as a nurse. So he's kind of shifted his identity to being a helpful person instead of being a failure who's struggling with substance use. I hope you can see that shift in identity that happened. Jeremy, uh, as you watched him, it sounds like he started pretty hopeless. When, did you, was there some point where he began to generate a sense of hopefulness or was that early on or later on or I always so, think of hope being so critical. Mm -hmm. So Walter, part of what happens is the solidarity of group treatment in Code Clinic empowers people. You know, they, they're all on the same mission and they, they're driving forward to kind of improve their lives. And they, they feel, they get a sense of hope from each other and they meet people who are doing well. So when someone goes to an NA meeting, they may hear, a, someone will chair a meeting and they hear a story and uh, this guy had a life just like mine, but he's doing way better now. And it makes it believable. You know, they, they feel impassioned to improve their lives because they see it can be done. So they pick up a lot of hope from the successes of other people. Partly, yeah. And just the fact that their providers believe that it helps. You know, you see it in the look inside a provider's eye. You know, when someone has that confidence that what they're doing is going to be helpful for you, it's an unconscious process. You hear it in their tone of voice. You, you see it in the look in their eye. All right, so case example two, 45-year-old female with a history of schizoaffective disorder, bipolar type, and alcohol use disorder who's been in treatment for her psychiatric condition since her early 20s. She lived with her parents her entire life and thought of herself as useless and worthless. She started drinking alcohol, mostly beer, which rapidly got out of control. On one intoxicated evening in a confused state of psychosis, she got into a fight with her father and stabbed him with a kitchen knife. She was hospitalized in a forensic psychiatric unit for 10 years. She was discharged with conditions that she stay in the psychiatric treatment 
refrain from substance use and comply with all treatment recommendations. She lived with her mother who had divorced. The patient got involved in a psychiatric rehabilitation program and told her story to other members of the program to help steer them toward a life of recovery. Giving back felt good and she liked the story she was writing about who she is now. So there's definitely some parallels in this story to the other story, but you see the, the initial identity. And then, so the initial identity is somebody who's worthless and useless and out of control. And uh, she had a terrible, you know, just a tragedy occur with her father and was in a forensic psychiatric unit for 10 years, but she made a big shift in identity. And now she tells her story to other people with mental illness and addictions and says, you know, look, my life is better, you know, and it inspires them. So she's got purpose and her identity is shifted. You guys see that? All right, so discussion points. So we are a natural expression of a deeper order. And so you can, people can elevate their identity and capitalize on it or assert their identity. And so when you want to flourish, you have to establish an identity empowerment and build from there and behave in ways that are consistent with your desired identity, your dreamiest identity. So you think of, you know, who do I want to become and how can I uh, take on that kind of behavior, the, what kind of person does those sort of things and how can I be that person? And most importantly, your behavior proves your identity to yourself. So someone may have like a grandiose sense of what they want to be, but their behavior doesn't prove that's who their identity is. And so uh, when someone has a strong identity and it's realistic, they prove who they are with their behavior. And so you can be filled with great pride and creative audacity and have a challenging and meaningful role in society. And think about, you know, how does richness of an identity give you advantage on the identity gradient? And does that impact physical health? People, can people heal from terminal illnesses with that? Uh, you know, is that going to affect kind of longevity? And does it affect mental health and recovery from addictions? I think so. So let's think about the implications. So we can construct an ultimate identity and assert it. And ideally, you want to be kind of relaxed and strong. You know, a strong identity is something you can relax into and feel comfortable with. And there's a good energy and kind of confidence. And so what is the promise of a radical shift in identity for people? You know, how much promise does that hold for people? And so people can keep reimagining their identity throughout their life. You know, like the fashion industry says, rebel and dream. Keep thinking of a better identity. And and kind of enhance your life. And then of course we wanna manage our resources. So thinking about those social determinants of health and all those resources, you wanna manage your resources. So future directions with identity. So uh, Carl Jung talked about archetypes. So maybe there can be identity archetypes associated with flourishing lives. You know, what, are, what are the identities that people have that are important identities that allow people to flourish? You know, that they get enacted in a way that helps someone flourish. And so like with the fashion industry, people have proposals for, for what, you know, what people can wear. Or, and so maybe we can have creative identity proposals, you know, that maybe someone can suggest a new kind of identity that's even more strong and distinctive. And maybe we could even find something where we'd say, hey, this is on a genetic level, you know, it's part of my DNA to have a strong and distinctive identity. And I was thinking, I was trying to think of what is the strongest identity that I can imagine. And I was thinking maybe you're a legend, is the strongest identity that someone could have. And so I, what, what, how do you prove that identity? You know, what, what kind of behavior proves that someone is a legend? So this last uh, slide, uh, we've got a butterfly here being pulled over by the police and he says, that's an old photo. And the, the policeman is looking at a caterpillar. So you can see how he shifted in his identity. Huh? All right, here's my references. So what do you guys think? Is the identity enactment important in health and quality of life and functioning? What do you guys think?
I was wondering if you could say something more about kind of group identity, because you're talking a lot about kind of individual identity, but it seems like a lot of folks kind of get stuck and caught in a certain group identity that is very difficult to kind of shift and change, whether it's leaving family or leaving groups of other folks struggling, that sort of thing. Yes, that's an interesting question, Joel. So what you see that in addiction. So people who fall into addictive behavior often have rebelled against mainstream culture because they weren't successful in the mainstream culture. And so they get involved in this addiction related culture and maybe they do beautifully in it and they actually feel stronger being in an addiction culture, but it dangers their lives and things fall apart. So uh, you know, ultimately it can be the, a destructive way to associate with people. And so the same way that they got into the addictive culture, they kind of have to rebel. They have to rebel out of that addictive culture and uh, get into a new culture, kind of find a different culture to associate with or create something that they think is healthier and more positive. And so you do that in a number of ways, you know, thinking about what is the influence of the people I associate with, social group reconstruction and, uh, you, you know, uh, Kind of thinking about how, how what is the impact of people in my life and how can I associate with healthier people and and you can find groups of people to associate with not so addiction patients go to AA and NA meetings which is a good way to meet people that are kind of a healthier subgroup or culture but maybe they would find it volunteering or uh, you know with a, a job that they have maybe there's a great culture at their work or the military maybe the military offers a strong kind of culture that they can associate with or a club, or you know, there's so many different organizations, uh, you know, maybe uh, campaigning for an elected official. There's lots of groups of people that someone can associate with that would be more positive than associating with, uh, you know, addiction-related culture. Was that helpful? Yes, and I, I was also thinking about the idea of roles, which is a little different than identity. You know, th this thought I've always had is that you know, we wear a lot of different hats every day. You know, we have a hat as, as a parent, as a partner, as a friend, as a physician, other things. And, you know, how you can kind of shift your roles and maintain a certain kind of identity, uh, I think is important. Totally true. And part of that is abandoning maybe a previous role that wasn't serving you. You know, so patients, for example, may have a role in their family that kind of doesn't work out and they feel miserable and uh, mistreated or taken advantage of or uh, marginalized. or And so you have to kind of abandon that old role and take on a role that's kind of more positive. I, th I think identity and role get they're related to each other, Joel. I, I know they're different concepts, but they I, part of identity is kind of the role that you serve. It, it, it's an element of identity to me. Jeremy, one of the pieces that I think about in, in some of what we do here is, is sort of how this applies to folks um, practically in rural areas, specifically in Appalachia. So, you know, I think that some pieces of their identity are, are very much the core of who they are um, and, and, uh, and that culture. But I also wonder how being able to sort of encourage someone to, to have a frame shift and, and teaching them how to practically do it are two different things. And so I yeah. wonder if you could speak to that a little bit. Yeah, so developing niches. So maybe not trying to catch up with, you know, the culture of some thriving metropolis, but maybe uh, trying to build niches of strength in your life that empower your identity. Maybe that's the place to start. And there's three ways to do that, you know, to correct stunting, to have parts that you develop that are strong, and to work on your environment so you grow a stronger identity. And work it, I'm working on niches. So you know, what are the areas of strength that I can develop? Or what are areas of strength I already have that I can develop more? And so that gives them that empowered feeling when they, when they work on those niches.
Any other questions? I know, I know something that's happening I'm, as a psychiatrist, you know, something that's happened in psychiatry is it's become very biologically focused, you know, what's the right medicine to be tailored to this person's problems. But uh, I, I'm trying to kind of think of psychiatry as getting someone from crisis stabilization to flourishing. And so it's, it's kind of opened up a, a window to me of thinking about more than just what pharmacologic agents can do for somebody. You know, how can we impel people to grow stronger and really flourish in life? And what, what is the potential of somebody in crisis? You know, what's the, what is, are we trying to get from negative five to zero? Or can we really get this person kind of into a sort of life where they're kind of feeling pretty good about who they've become? And I think if you ask patients what they would like, you know, I, I think maybe there's certain expectations of the medical model, but if you ask patients what they're hoping for, it's usually more than just not being depressed or not anxious or what have you. You know, Jeremy, I think if sometimes the self-image is like a stained glass window, that uh, when we meet people, they're pretty dingy, pretty, you know, not much coming through. We gradually let them change one pain at a time where they start emitting a much different light, like some of those cases you saw. They looked quite different at the end than they did at the, at the start. And one metaphor is that they're now allowing, the, you know, this, this new light to come in, and but it has to be changed one pain at a time, you know, and uh, it's, 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 well, it's process, obviously, but it's kind of amazing how the identity can change over time, given you know, given opportunity and some of these, uh, some of these resources you're highlighting. It is interesting to think about, you know, you can't do too much at once. It would overwhelm the individual, but you can chip away at this, you know, kind of chip away at the kryptonite, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Some of the pains are really big and some are really small. You just have to replace them. You know? Yeah. All right, well, thank you very much, everybody. I hope you enjoyed that. Thanks, Jeremy.